Welcome back, everyone. My name is Bert Correa. I'm Taino, a descendant of the indigenous people of the Caribbean. In today's session, we'll meet Michael Shiashi and Lee Francis IV, who helped us in the creation of the new permanent exhibition, Native New York, which is housed at the National Museum of American Indian in New York. And with the related lesson about the early encounters in Native New York, did Native people really sell Manhattan? They have also supported the work of our National Education Initiative, Native Knowledge 360, in developing both exhibitions and NK360 content, such as this digital lesson, the museum is looking for a way to connect young people to difficult subjects in ways that are digestible. Many of our lessons and the museum's exhibition work to break stereotypes about Native peoples and histories, something we have planned. Generally, Native people are only taught in the past tense and often in rather stoic or serious ways. The images here are serious topics, but the idea of integrating hand-drawn and animated images in the lessons appeal to people of all ages, because it's both visually exciting and accessible. One of the benefits of these graphic images is it can convey more information in less time and a smaller space than words alone. Today, we're joining you from the National Museum of the American Indian in New York City, which is part of the Smithsonian's institution, a complex of museums, libraries, a zoo, and research centers. We have two exhibition locations, one in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall, and one in New York City in Lower Manhattan. Our collection is housed at the Cultural Resources Center in Suitland, Maryland. Last session, we talked about representation, how to counteract stereotypes, and how to become more accessible to a younger audience across generations. It's also a way to connect a contemporary medium to historical content and tell difficult and often absent stories in compelling ways. Today, we'll be discussing complex or difficult topics, questions to ask of the text, and how to look at the work and exciting project that the artists featured are doing. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jen Shannon, who will be speaking with two of the artists, the two artists we spoke to last week, Michael Shiashi and Dr. Lee Francis. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jen Shannon, a curator and manager of community engagement programs at the National Museum of the American Indian. I also co-produce a comic series that tells true stories about repatriation. And it is my distinct pleasure today to be speaking with Michael Shiashi and Dr. Lee Francis. Michael Shiashi is a member of the Caddo Nation. He has two bachelor's degrees from the University of Oklahoma, one in Native American Studies and the other in film. He, he earned his MFA in 3D modeling from the Academy of Art University. Michael is also the author of Native Americans in Comic Books, a critical study, and the founder of Alternative Media, an indigenous-owned business that provides custom, creative, and technical solutions, ranging from graphic novels to interactive 3D simulations. Michael has written comic stories for the first three volumes of Moonshot, the indigenous comics collection, and served as a cultural consultant for Dark Horse Comics. Dr. Lee Francis is a member of Laguna Pueblo. He earned his PhD from Texas State University. He is the head indigenous and CEO of Native Realities, the only Native indi and indigenous pop culture company in the United States, founded with the hope of changing perceptions of Native and indigenous people through dynamic and imaginative pop culture representations. He's also the co-founder of Red Planet Books and Comics, now ETCG, a tribe called Geek in Albuquerque. It's the only native comic shop in the world. ATGC is also the headquarters for the Indigipop X Expo and Convention. Dr. Francis has published in multiple genres from poetry to short stories. Welcome to you both, Michael and Lee. I am really excited about our chat today. Thanks so much for being here. Since you each started this work, I'm wondering, what have you learned about yourself or your culture or community or even society through doing this kind of work? Michael, let's start with you. Sure. You know, I, uh, when writing the book Native Americans and Comics, uh, I learned a lot, not only about the industry and the artist and such, but also the choices they had to make, the difficult uh, ideas they had to put on paper and such. So what I learned about myself is, is really that something I already knew. I mean, I loved comics. I knew that, right? But what I didn't know is I had the ability as an indigenous person to really culminate and sort of like 
ferret out what I like and don't like it and, and really give some support about why I felt that way. Um, so in me, the journey was not only the discovery of myself and, and, and why I might have these feelings, but also the, the pure joy of meeting other people in the comic book industry, really. And Lee, how about you? So similar to Michael, I started out with, um, you know, uh, looking at pop culture through theater. And so my undergrad uh, paper, my undergrad thesis was around Native American theater. And so I think when I first started out, it was it was sort of peeling this onion of, of like, well, here's where a lot of these representations of Native people come from. And here's these eras that they have kind of been the, the changes in representation. It's not always been the same. It's, you know, there's 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 been various aspects to it for the last three, four centuries. So, like, I came in with this sort of fundamental, but coming into comics and doing this pop culture work is this ongoing, amazing learning process about, like, digging deeper into the folks that have been doing this work, um, you know, Native folks that you that you wouldn't necessarily have heard of that are working in stuff. They're not making a Native comic. They're making just, they're just a comic person. But then they've got this other thing on the side. So getting to meet those folks... Um, finding out more of the history of illustration, native you know native illust- native illustrators, and the work that they've been doing. Um, so it's just like this continual learning process. I mean, all sorts of stuff just continues to 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 emerge um, on on the daily for for all this incredible work. So, I mean, I love that process for learning. Um, for me, I think it the you know personally the whole exploration around native identity and really galvanizing on this idea that we are not, uh, you know, we are not wedded. Uh, we, we're not wedded to, we're not bound by tragedy. Um, it is something that exists. It is something that is part of our story is something that, that that's part of what we have to, uh, deal with in terms of living in this modern time. Um, many of our ancestors didn't make it, but that this this binding is this is this these these shackles that we exist with, and I think creating this kind of work and this pop culture work is around bringing joy and heroics and you know bringing uh, celebration, and I think that that has really moved my spirit and moved me into a much better sense that I'm I'm much more focused on celebrating our victories. Um, than miring in our tragedies. Well, I'm wondering, as we're um, kind of engaging with teachers today, how have each of you seen teachers and students using comics? Lee, do you want to start us off with that? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so I, it's, been, it's been an interesting shift uh, because it's gone from sort of this really like corridor of, of nerdiness to a lot of people are, are sorting, are looking around being like, what, what more is out there? What can I teach from? And what can I teach with? What can I bring in for my students um, that, that will engage their attention? Cause one of the things that I think we're, we're all recognizing is that we live in a very visual age. It's not, it's a digital age, but it's very visually oriented and that, what we're looking more for and what young people are really gravitating towards is stories. You're seeing the things like the rise of TikTok and YouTube shorts and reels because they're wanting very quick stories. So in some ways, I think comics fit really well into that, not because the length of the the comic, it can be really, you know, really difficult sometimes to pick up like the omnibus of something that's, you know, the the size of of a giant club sandwich. And that you're going to eat it like almost like trying to wrap your brain around it, like you wrap your mouth around a, a club that 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 aside, what you're looking at is internally, they're very quick stories that are being told pages and panels, panels and gutters in one page. You can tell an incredibly complex, dynamic story with very little words. You can tell something that digs into issues like NAGPRA and sovereignty and, you know, historical relevance. You can do that in a small amount of time. And I think that really is appealing to young people. Um, And I think that's great for teachers to be able to hook onto that because they can provide something that not only scaffolds literacy, uh, it helps provide historical context and shades and frames things differently. It realigns visual interpretations, especially around Native identity, because it's been so permeated and permanent with, 
you know, as we talked in our last one, the, the hyper masculine native or the super exoticized Pocahontas, right? So it changes that. And, and little by little with young people, you can change those perceptions. You can change those internalized representations to create that, that space of cognitive dissonance that opens a window for learning. So if what they've been told in the media is that all Native women look like Pocahontas and all of a sudden we show a strong Native woman, you know, that's that's like like, yeah, you know, like Lozen or whatever, you know, like a representation or the stuff that Wisho Yo does with my sisters and these representations of strong Native Echo. women. Yeah. Wisho, <laughs> Wisho Echo, right? Wisho Yo Vitre, my, my, one of my artist partners as well. She does some amazing work. But Echo, like all these are strong Native women. Well, now a young person has to try and make sense of that. Because not all Native women look like this, which is what they were told, but here's some that don't. And so it opens that window, and that's that space for learning. Um, so I think that comics do that because it's not all intellectual. It's not all up here. It's visual, it's tangible, and it appeals to this particular generation um, to make learning more powerful and compelling. Thanks. Michael, what are your thoughts about how you've seen teachers and students interact with this kind of work? You know, personally, uh, as a young kid in high school, I remember, again, that community I built with other people that like comics. I remember one of my buddies didn't want to read A Tale of Two Cities, right? But he found, I think it's called Classic Illustrated or whatever it was. And so he found these comics and he was really able to glean on to the really good ideas there. So why do I bring that up? I, I feel like in many, in many ways, you know, we've seen, at least in my lifetime, although I'm old, a really a, a transition away from, oh, they're just funny pages, they're just funny books, to, yeah, this is actually, you know, the people are reading, the the, the people are, are getting messages. And as Dr. Francis said, you know, we, we talked in the last session uh, about Understanding Comics, the book by Scott McCloud. And one thing he talks about that I really glom onto when I'm talking about comics for like an e-learning conference or something is we can tell these stories. And comics help you do that by being very concise, right? As, as Dr. Francis was talking about, there are panels. As I talked about with discovering, you know, the artists and, and the writers of the comics, there are choices that have to be made editorially to, to add something to not. And so understanding just that about comics and then adding the nuance uh, and filter of in, indigeneity and, and culture really allows you to go, oh, it's a teaching tool. And in the same respect, I can nuance it by allowing this influence of, of native stories, of native imagery, of ideas and ideals to come in. Uh, and, you know, within that same respect, when I was in school, when I was in public school and high school, we didn't have speakers come in. But I know after I've written the book, I've had the opportunity to go to, you know, tribal camps over the summer and, and talk about how to make comics. Um, I go to elementary school and high school sometimes, especially for career day when they're talking. So I'm really seeing a change, at least, you know, in, in the North American system away from comics are just something to throw away to something that like, oh, there is information there. How can we discern that? How can we dissect it? And how can we better understand it? Yeah, I think that's all um, a wonderful way of seeing. And I think it kind of, a lot of people just see sort of the images and text on the page, but don't realize how much research and reference images and reference text and you know oral histories or talking to people goes in behind the scenes to to make sure that it comes out that way. So I appreciate you pulling out some of that behind the scenes work too as well. Um, well, you know, just as you're kind of indicating in your discussion, often when people hear about comics, they think they're not serious or they aren't taken seriously. So I'm wondering if we can talk a little more deeply about um, native involvement in the comic and graphic novel world. Um, how, do you, how you might see teachers and kids using the comics and specifically around the concept of um, addressing difficult or complex subjects. Um, so let's start with Michael and then Lee, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. I think I'll be brief. I, you know, one thing that talks about the complexity and, and the messages that we're trying to convey through the comic as a, as a communicative medium uh, one thing comes to mind, Dr. Francis and I were on a project for the Office of Victims of Crime recently where we produced, I think, eight comic books or six comic books uh, for different age groups. But they were really focused on identifying the justice system and identifying what happens to you as an indigenous child potentially in the system. Um, 
And as we just talked about, for me, that was very complex. And I didn't realize that many of those, those ideas and those notions, and we never got very heavy with these comics, by the way, but I personally had a lot of emotion for the, you know, these characters that I created. I, I had to imagine, well, what if this person had to go live with their aunt? What if this person received some trauma or whatever? Uh, and it really, you know, bubbled up and brought up a lot of stuff of my own. But it, it's really that idea of we can now use comics in a way. And I think there's another example uh, of um, Mate culture, right, from Canada, like uh, another one that we can talk about. But these ideas that have been very prominent in Indigenous culture are ones that we had a hard time discussing with those outside of our group. And things like comics and, and, and tools allow us to go, hey, here, read this and let's talk about it later, right? Or, hey, did you read that? Or did you see that episode of Reservation Dogs? Hey, I, let's talk about that one part, right? So it, it's just another tool to allow us to find some footing within the world and communicate in an effective manner. So when I create comics, they often come from a place of wanting to tell various stories. And there is a complexity. There is a difficulty sometimes in some of the issues. So one of the other ones that I worked on with, with to both that I worked on with Michelle Yalvitre um, and, and her incredible work, uh, you know, uh, as a comic book illustrator, uh, the most recent one we did was Ghost River, um, which tells the story of the 1763 massacre outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania of the Conestoga peoples. Um, and it's very difficult subject matter. And, and I think the ways in which you can use visuals uh, in, in a way that's creative um, and, and striking, I think is one of the, one of the ways in which you, you can approach these differently. I mean, you can approach them with a, with definitely a blunt force hammer, right? I'm just gonna, we're gonna show the tragedy and everybody's dead and there's mangled body parts. But I think in, 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 when you're looking at comics and when you're discerning the kind of comics you'd like to use in your spaces, and especially around native sensitive, uh, native indigenous issues, you can come into it, uh, from a way that generates a different aesthetic. For example, in Ghost River, which you can find at www.ghostriver.org. If anybody wants to go, you can check that out. It's free, free download, great teacher resources for it to teach the whole history of, um, teaches around the Conestoga as well as the Lenape outside of Philadelphia. Um, lots of lesson plans for all you teachers over there. Really great uh, 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 piece. Um, and I think it's a nice little parallel piece because of Lenape in New York, because there's some, you know, the connections there with the, with the, with those folks. Um, there was, we, we made a very conscious decision at the time. We made two conscious decisions, which were backed up by the editor. One was that we were not going to call the murderers. We weren't going to call them. They were, they were known around the time as the Paxton boys or the Paxton boys. Um, and we were very clear that we weren't going to do that. We weren't going to call them boys. It wasn't, oh, just boys being boys, going out, murdering, killing Native folks, you know, innocent Native folks. They were murderers. And so we called them murderers throughout the text. We made sure that that was the terminology that we used. So one is, is in dealing with things, is dealing with them you know, upfront and deliberately in a way that, you know, that, that we call things out for what they, what they are and what they, what they were and what they are. Um, and, and being very intentional about that and recognizing the intentionality behind the people that are creating these things. So that was one aspect of it. And part of that was that we would never show their faces. So they were shadows. Um, we approached that in a way that they were never to, they, they don't get a spotlight. They've already had a spotlight. They've had hundreds of years of spotlight. So we wanted to make sure that they didn't have any more of a platform. It's not about wiping them out or censoring. It's about privileging, right? So that's what I was like to talk about when people was like, oh, you're censoring. I was like, it's not censoring. It's privileging. They've already had privilege. We're privileging somebody else's story in this moment. So when we're telling that story, that was, we, we never showed their faces. We also never showed native people like close-ups of native people dead, dying, or dismembered, right? The sense around it. And this really comes from the work that we show you and I had, had done on our previous comic book with six killer, um, that we weren't showing that part of, of, you know, the, the consistent narrative that we see, like the, the, you know, the photos that always show up, you know, um, around wounded knee. Right. Um, and and any of these massacres of like natives strewn across the ground. So we made very conscious decisions around that. But what came out of that was one of the most beautiful aesthetic pages that I, I could have in my wildest dreams did not come up with. In fact, Wish Oyo came up with it was in the last sort of part of the massacre when the 
the Paxton murderers, when the mob descends upon the workhouse in Lancaster, where the 16, the 14 remaining Native folks, uh, the Conestoga, are being held um, over Christmas. Uh, when they come in, uh, you know, we I had a scene originally portrayed that it was going to be like sort of shadowy coming in and then these shadows leave and all we see is just like, you know, the sort of wreckage behind them. And we found out historically, again, we had help from NMAI and a lot of great historians that it, they weren't they weren't like murdered in inside. They were murdered in the main courtyard. And so we show you went back. She's like, let me take a whack at it. She rewrote the scene. And in this scene, we we basically show the people as wampum and wampum beads. And so in that last act of destruction and that final massacre is it's a tearing of the wampum itself and the wampum goes scattering and the people become the beads. And so we found this beautiful connection between the wampum, of course, being part of our, our souls being part of, you know, those people's souls and their spirit in this long history. Right. So it was a way to do that. That was aesthetic that can tackle something that is a you know that is that is incredibly difficult incredibly complex um in a way that is so appealing and visual and i think that's one of the ways to be able to approach these kinds of issues the visual nature of it and especially the folks that are doing work now the visual nature of these things is really um outstanding uh and especially and when i say the folks that are doing this, i mean native folks that are, are making comics right now are doing some exceptional work to cover a lot of the uh, cover a lot of ground um and and concisely i think michael called it out like you only have you know you, you have a small amount of, of room to tell a visual story and if you you know and and if you've got good editors you only have a small a number of pages to tell that visual story and i think that is one of the the key components that we talked about sort of on day one of you know th th this combining sequential art is combining text and image to make something greater than the two you have more real estate to tell the story um where you can use text in one space and you don't need it in another space because the visual brings that in so i think all of that the kind of the final point is all that of the native folks that are you know native and indigenous folks that are creating comics and graphic novels and tackling a lot of these issues from their own community from their own perspective a lot of it having to do with with representation they want to see themselves in comics a lot of it dealing with with these types of issues with you know tragedies in community genocide and ethnocide and how do we rise beyond that how do we continue beyond that um what kind of hero is going to be there to take care of us because superman ain't coming to the res right I mean, he's come to it once. There is one issue, but like the natives are shooting with there. It's a whole thing. Anyway, he's not coming to save us and tackle this stuff. So we are need to take care of our ourselves. And so the artists and creatives are are making that. And I will say in this last five years, there has been an, just an explosion uh, of of native comic book creativity and talent um, that, you know, I'm 46. So that has not been around in my previous 40 some years. Thanks, Lee. There's so much in there. I have to say on a comic that we're working on right now, um, a grandmother wears a cape and is the superhero, right? For all that she's done in her community. So <laughs> um, uh, I also wanted to just point out a little bit of what you said around this real emphasis on who tells, who tells the story matters. So, um, you know, the, that idea of privileging different uh, people's perspectives and contributions to historical events um, and how that's kind of reverberated through generations to today, you know, it's so important who's telling the story of history because anyone can pick out which, you can't tell every minute of every day of everyone's experience. So every history writer is choosing what's important and it comes out so differently when, those who are choosing what's important are indigenous writers and visual artists that can convey things visually that, you know, like the, the people shrouded in um, um, shadow, right? That That's not physically explained anywhere necessarily. You know, it, it may be in, you know, depending on the comics author, author but it's this visual cue that helps um, right. bring that, that understanding. So um, I would also want to do a shout out about Ghost River. Not only does it embrace the tying together of lesson plans, education and, and history telling through comics, um, but 
you know, it's also got all of the source materials in the back. It's got kind of like the references cited, you know, that people can look to mm-hmm. do, so it's really exciting, which I think is great for, for students to understand where the stories come from and how they get translated into something that's narrative form. So thank you for sharing that example with us. Um, given that you have a comic book shop, Lee, and that I that Ghost River and a lot of these other comics are in there, I'm just wondering if you've seen any greater influx of teachers there or if they're coming in with any specific kinds of information that they're looking for? Yeah. So we've been really kind of operating a lot online um, because we're hitting a broad audience. So we get, we would get, we did a lot of outreach to like the local teachers. A lot of folks were, were looking for a lot of different books. Um, but comics would always be one of those, those like what you've got comics too. And so they would grab like these swaths of that. And I think they were looking, I mean, a lot of it really boiled down to just the representational to fill the shelves with things that look like their students, um, you know, especially in Albuquerque um, and now operating and doing work in North Carolina. Uh, same thing over here is folks are just like, we'd love to see things that look like that. what I would run into more often than not was, is there something for my community? And that's the, you know, that's the difficult part, right? It's like, we'll get, we're going to try and get there. We're hoping if, you know, if it's not us, then we're helping guide or shepherd somebody, you know, from your community to be able to help tell that story or to put it into, into action. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I think we, we saw, you know, that there is an educational component that uh, uh, for the work that we do, there's an educational component that appealed to teachers and educators and still continues to, to appeal to teachers and educators. Well, Michael, I know that, you know, between your volumes in, like Moonshot um, and your company, I'm wondering how you see those influencing young people and the industry as well. Well. You know, building on what Dr. Francis was talking about, I too in the last decade, and especially since the book came out like 15 years ago or whatever, I've really seen, as he mentioned, an explosion of indigenous people in the industry. And and I want to take a moment and celebrate that because I think that's fantastic. And I think along the way, technology has also kind of helped us along. Um, I can't tell you the number of like uh, crowdsourced or Kickstarter funded uh, things I've been a part of that have really worked out, that have really allowed indigenous people to have our voice and to tell our own story. Um, when I was editing uh, volume three of Moonshot, so Dr. LaPonce and I, uh, Elizabeth LaPonce is a fantastic person. She um, really holds true to this idea of like, there has to be this message and it has to fit within it. In case in point, you know, we were focusing on indigenous futurisms, the idea borrowed from uh, Afrofuturisms, right? The idea of the, of the continuance or the permanence of history and, and, and the present and the future all in one, right? So within that respect, it, it really allows us to have an entire realm, if you will, of our own. And I, I don't think this is something and absolutely wouldn't have been able to have accomplished you know, years ago. So let's say in the late 90s, early 2000s, before we had this sort of platform, uh, as Lee was talking about, it was far and few between to find indigenous people working in the comic industry. There was some, uh, not a whole lot, right? Uh, but that was something that I found fantastic. And it, it's like we were saying, you know, being able to have an editorial voice and, and go, this is what's important to my group. This is what's important to me, rather than accepting what mainstream pop culture, you know, force feeds us. I think that's fantastic. And quite frankly, allows us that sort of tapestry of additional voices to add to it. So it's been very uh, fortuitous and I'm very glad to be a part of it. So, Thank you so much. Well, I want to take a pause so we can turn to the teachers right now. Um, Teachers, you can use the chat and tell us what you think about using graphic art as a way to teach kids about complex and difficult subjects. Um, And share your experience about using comics or graphic novels too. We appreciate all the teachers and you sharing uh, your experiences with us. Um, The next section that we're going to be talking about um, are some of the more difficult scenes that are portrayed within the exhibition. And so, um, Lee, I was wondering if you could walk us through some examples of comics that deal with complex or difficult subjects that we have here. 
Yeah. So each of these three, we've talked a little bit about Ghost River. I'll kind of work from right to left. I don't know, whatever direction, but we can start there because we've talked about Ghost River. Ghost River, of course, deals with, you know, uh, what we can classify as, you know, genocide in real time. What happened to the Conestoga people, uh, you know, the last of those people ceased to exist on December 26th, 1763. Uh, we have, you know, they, they, some kin, they scattered all, all over, but this last group of people that were maintaining that home space, oh, we're no longer there. So that deals with, with genocide, uh, in real time. Um, Sugar Falls deals with the issues of, and the abuses and the horrors of residential schools, um, and, and boarding schools and the impact it has, the, the long lasting impact it has, the generational trauma on indigenous communities and native communities, um, especially uh, up north. And Surviving the City deals with MMIW, MMIR, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, um, Indigenous Relatives, and uh, how the, you know, the, the trauma that, uh, that pervades a lot of that and, and the targeting that still goes on to this day and, and how it deals with it in a modern context. So all of those deal with very difficult subjects <clears throat> in a way that the visuals allow for what I want to say is, you know, both both putting the emotions in a space, uh, in and and allowing the story to be a healing process, a healing journey, and the visuals work really well with that because if let's say you just have a single standing image, that sparks an emotion, there's a visceral reaction, but wedding this to wedding those visuals to a narrative. Uh, has so many multiple layers. One, we can talk about just the basic layers that um, that Scott McCloud talks about in Understanding Comics, which is the psychology of going, you know, of panels, that your brain does some really cool things of like connecting up the time, the framing uh, from panel to panel. You're not being fed like a movie or a film. Um, it's not 30 frames per second. It's six panels per page, right, or in essence. So there's a base layer for that psychologically, what that does. The second that we can see is having Native people as the main characters, they're not sidekicks. So it undoes a lot of that, uh, the pervasive, uh, you know, framing that we always have in Western society of, you know, uh, d d Anglo characters as our heroes. This is Native characters that we're telling and centering the focus, focusing the story on. So essentially we're, we're, we're coming at it from um, what Leanne Howe calls tribalography, right? So it is centering the, na the native story and the native narrative and everything else revolves around that. So there's that level of it. The third level that goes into it is, um, you know, this repealing, how are we undermining these, these traditional images uh, that we've seen in Western, uh, you know, uh, Western narratives uh, and Western um, uh, pop culture of Native peoples. So it undermines that. So those are the three sort of basics. Then you have how do we deal with these very difficult issues? Well, we tell them in a way that's human, that's authentic, um, that is that is that that deals around culture and understandings and a depth of that because they're Native writers, Indigenous writers that are a part of this it brings a deeper level and deeper meaning. And so that meaning from the ways in which there are what we've been calling Easter eggs, but things that would be culturally specific that maybe I don't understand, but a person from that community is absolutely gonna understand the significance and meaning from that. I can understand some of the broader themes, but oftentimes we find that native folks write for their own communities. They're gonna write about issues that are important in their community from these perspectives. So. When we're, why I think it is important to use comics and to use culturally specific, culturally relevant, culturally centered comics in telling difficult stories is because you get a much clearer perspective on the issue at hand told in a way that allows for healing, education, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a combination of both to take place simultaneously through the reading. Thanks, Lee. Well, Michael, I would like to turn to specific panels within the exhibition and ask you a similar question as we go through it with you. Um, I'd love if you could speak to us about this piece, how you make choices when working in the genre, but also to kind of follow up on Lee's discussion about, you know, why uh, comics are a, a good medium for teaching difficult and complex subjects as we look at this together. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, 
as we look at this, you know, obviously the subject matter is a difficult one at best. And I know earlier I talked about it's very important to ensure that native humor is invested within our stories. This isn't necessarily one that needed native humor. Uh, it would really detract it, detracted from it. So as you hear us talk about creating these, and again, beautiful art by Maria the Wolf Lopez here, fantastic work. Um, but really we're looking at the Pawnee people as they traverse through a few US treaties, one of which was affected by their decimation with smallpox. Um, and that alone, if I'm just gonna leave that there, the word smallpox, right? That alone, it's a disease, as you can see on the, the page, it's visceral. There are real traumatic events and, and that balance of making sure that we're informing a large populace of something that really happened, right? These people really got sick and the, the tribe really got decimated and the people, but making sure that the understanding of, of the gravity of that situation is there on the page in that succinct manner that we keep talking about was challenging at best, right? Um, it's a very serious topic. Um, you know, how far do you get, how, how far do you push that message? Meaning when I am explaining this, and by the way, thank, thankfully, you know, the NMAI people had all this information to go along with this, right? So what you're seeing on, on the screen is, is just visuals, it's not text, but the text was deeper into the story itself for Native Knowledge 360. But, you know, in this particular reference, really understanding how far to push some of those visceral elements to make sure that we, we have that gravitas, but not go too far. We're just celebrating the disease itself or celebrating, you know, the evil white people that gave the blankets or whatever. We just wanted to show what was going on. Uh, and we tried to go simple with that. As you notice on the left, we have sort of the progression of, of how the disease might have ravaged through someone's body. Uh, we have, you know, limited people as this disease goes forward, trying to offer some comfort and some care. And then eventually we see many members just kind of fading away and not fading, right? But this literally decimated a lot of people. So when we talk about comics and their ability to communicate messages, this and many other examples are ones that we put a lot of thought into as comic creators. But we also want to make sure that we're doing it for the purpose of celebrating that we're still here in continuance despite these you know, major things, but also the fact that these things happened. We can't ignore them. Uh, we can't just put a nice face. We can't put the, you know, the Barbara Walters filter Vaseline on this image and make it prettier because it wasn't a pretty idea to begin with. So again, you'll hear, you hear some of these challenges we go through. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, you can read smallpox on a page, but that doesn't mean you understand what it does to someone. And the visuals are really educational at the same time, as well as devastating um, to convey that. And I appreciate I appreciate that individual versus kind of community perspective on that. Lee, do you have any thoughts to add to this particular uh, panel? I mean, I think that that's the, 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 the piece and the way that it speaks to is that it does um it still has a narrative that goes with it even though it's it's you know it's it's part of this this um it's a small portion of a bigger narrative and an understanding and the visuals again pack so much that you can see it uh that it's reflecting you know the reality of what happened and again that aesthetic um you in in a way that that draws more than say a photograph could uh that can that can do more than say just reading about smallpox on the text um and and reading the primary sources our brains operate through images we're 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 wired that way and even you know even when there's not you know brains even even when you're you're visually impaired your brain still operates in images it just changes sound to that or it changes there's different ways that it then creates the image in your head. And so putting it onto the page allows for a guide post um, to, to lock in some of those images and those, and those reflection pieces. And for something like this, I think it's, you know, it's, it's key to understand what native folks had to go through. We don't have pictures from then. We have some, maybe some hand-drawn illustrations that show up in, you know, primary source narratives, but you know, we're not, we're not seeing those. So this is a, this is a, an important way to be able to show what, uh, you know, our ancestors had to survive through. Yeah, and I mean, even the illustrators back then, they were primarily European and they were operating mm -hmm. with visual languages that showed native peoples in very specific ways that 
we're not accurate either oftentimes. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's great. Um, well, let's look at another example together um, from the exhibition. Michael, could you tell us a little bit more about this piece on boarding schools and some of the decisions behind how it was drawn and written? Certainly. Uh, and honestly, it's a much easier conversation than, say, the smallpox one, you know. But the ideas and the editorial concerns remain the same. In this way, we really wanted to punch home the really sort of split duality that occurs, you know, or can occur when someone goes to boarding school, right? You know, you see the, the forefront uh, of the figures, the, uh, you know, male and female characters going in and having, you know, very visually native and then coming out and being very visually Anglo, if you will, for lack of a better term. We really tried to showcase as much as we could, whether it was sort of like the ushering of the small children with some unknown stranger to a school, physically showing the school, trying to show some some what we imagined it might have been, you know, sort of cramped, hard little desk, that sort of things. Uh, really, the idea here is, as we talked about, is to make sure we have as much information visually packed into this page as we can, again, supporting all the wonderful information provided by the Smithsonian and others. So. Again, this one was done by the fantastic Maria the Wolf Lopez. And really the, the aspect here was, again, part of the series for you know the Pawnee people as they dealt with various treaties and, 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 and also as they dealt with various systems, in this case, you know the boarding school system, uh, really showcasing the idea of the, the dynamic, the, 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 the posture that one assumes after, right? Uh, you notice in neither one of those cases in the left or right of the two figures, neither they don't look hopeful either way, right? They, they don't look full of posit positivity. So that was a choice as well. Uh, but just to make people that maybe weren't familiar with that story, because many of us are, but maybe just give it, you know, punch it home really um, succinctly in a way that allows someone to go, oh, right, I understand now. This is this is what these people went through. So it was uh, it was a challenge to getting this one, but not as not as challenging as the uh, smallpox one. So, Michael, I will say that oftentimes, you know, I've taught university classrooms and a lot of times undergraduates are angry that they never learned about this history. So it certainly is familiar to folks in our sort of, <laughs> you know, conversational partners and stuff. But I think broadly, it's so wonderful that this is part of the exhibit and available to teachers to, to tell that story with. Um, Lee, any any thoughts from you on this one? No, I think that's one of the 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 amazing parts about the work that's being done with NK360, with the Native New York exhibit, um, I had some friends that I brought at the opening of the exhibit. Uh, both of them are lifelong New Yorkers. You know, they've traveled around two different generations. So probably somebody that I would say is closer to the boomers and, you know, someone millennial, right? Um, there's the section in the Native New York event around Van Cortlandt Park um, and, you know, what took place. And they both literally were standing there saying they're standing in front of this big, it's a huge, you know, uh, uh, you know, piece in the exhibit itself. And they're looking at it and they're reading. They're like, you know, uh, I used to do track at Van Cortlandt Park. It's a big place to do track because of the space. So cross country and track, both of them did it. And they were like, we never knew the history of this place that we were running on. And I found that so compelling. And I still tell that story to folks that come by. I was like, this is something they're like, we never learned this. We never learned this in our history books. We never learned this in New York history, you know, and it, it, it didn't get covered. And so those kinds of pieces, I think, in creating a visual to go with it is so striking to be able to have that kind of work that comes out. And what I will say is that it, it there's something else that it does is that it uncouples these these narratives that we have. Again, I talked a little bit, I think, before about how that cognitive distance creates a little space for learning. Because if you open that space, then you have more of a chance and more flexibility. It opens, it opens the window just a crack. And you got to do some work to keep moving it up. But once it's open, you get some different air in there. And one of the things that I talk about in terms of how we deal with a lot of Native history as it's taught uh, and as we know it is that it's very entrenched in American mythologies and ideologies and that so we don't get any we don't get these stories that 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 are variations that deviate from the mythology itself. So we don't we don't talk about Thanksgiving uh, in a way that talks about the the natives as being, you know, skilled diplomats and negotiators that the whole uh, concept of feasting was very important for that group of people to connect with 
you know, these 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 new folks that had resources because their enemies are on their doorstep, right? So this was treaty. This was these were negotiations. The mythology has become, you know, puritanical that it was, you know, the gift from God and, you know, to, and the natives handed all this bounty over. And that creates that underpinning of this grand mythology, this grand narrative that this was all gifted uh, to the conqueror. Right. So when we have that, that then filters in with our own personal narratives and our own personal narratives then cement these two together. So, for example, the history that I know about Thanksgiving, well, I also, you know, Thanksgiving for me is, you know, is watching football and being with family and eating too much. And, you know, like when I was a kid, we used to go see a movie on Thanksgiving. So after all the eating was done, we'd go watch a movie. So then all my personal narratives then get tied up in that. And so a lot of our work visually is to uncouple those narratives from each other, which is here's a visual representation of the history that's not just intellectual that is visual, emotive, visceral. And then here's your personal thing. And those two things can be separate from each other. Here's the actual history that is uncoupled from the mythology. And here's your own personal history. So when we say like, you know, dealing with mascot issues, for example, when we're saying like, we're just wanting an actual representation, we want a, you know, a true reconciliation and uncoupling that the personal from the the you know from the, the the grand narrative itself so i think you know in work like this around smallpox around the boarding schools bringing that history in allows us to reconcile and begin to uncouple from our own personal narratives uh from these grand narratives to see it as they are and to see them because a lot of these images have been reinforced a lot of this mythology has been reinforced by images big paintings and portraits, you know, this constant replication. What is it? The end of the trail is one of, you know, the most widely used the, the native, you know, the hunched native on horseback into the sunset, right? This defeated native, this defeated native warrior on horseback, you know, heading out. And it's the romanticized West, but it is a myth. And so we use the images themselves. And I think in really compelling ways and thoughtful ways to uncouple ourselves from those mythologies, to allow our personal mythologies to remain, but these other ones to create that little space to get that fresh air. Thank you, Leah. I think so much of what you talk about helps model critical thinking about pop culture, <laughs> both you know what's being created anew and what's been done in the past. And I also love how these new pieces that are being provided in exhibitions like this model new language to use, like you said, negotiating, diplomacy, all of that. Um, and so I think that's really wonderful for educators and for the public in general. So I want to thank both of you for all the work that you did on this. Um, but before we wrap up, the one thing I'd love to know and share with everyone is just to spend a few minutes of our time talking about what's next for both of you. So um, Lee, what's on your plate? What's coming next for you? Oh, we always got something moving. The The newest thing that's going to become, well, we have one new thing. We just released a great uh, book by Roy Boney Jr., incredible Cherokee artist, um, comic book creative illustrator called Sky. It's a his take on a traditional spooky story. Um, you know, uh, wonderfully illustrated. We, we did a different kind of style with big, you know, single, almost like a kid's book, but still reads like a comic because it's got kind of a narrative around it's for, you know, older readers. So, so it's like, we just call it single panel comics, right? So it's just like one, one page of his, his beautiful, uh, art and illustration. So we just released that for me as an artist and a writer, I just got my inks back for, uh, the new comic that we're putting out called Cindy Coyote trickster extraordinaire. Um, so it is about a young woman who is the daughter of coyote uh, and a native woman, and uh, she has to navigate her way through, uh, you know, her her guess, her demi god status, her demi trickster status, uh, as well as high school. So you can think it's uh, you know native Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Veronica Mars, uh, you know supernatural, right? So it's got it's like a little it's got a little CW flavor in there um, for this new comic. So we'll be putting that together, and that should be coming out for me pretty soon. And then, of course, the big thing every year is we're getting ready in April of 2024 for Digipop X, uh, you know, which is uh, we brought it back this last year. It's our annual celebration of all things native pop culture. 
uh, that can exist in the world. So we're going to have fun. We got guests, we got uh, activities, we got comic books, we got games. Uh, it's a wonderful three day festival and we're super excited uh, to be hosting at the first American museum in Oklahoma city. Very nice. That's all so exciting. Um, so Michael, what about you? What's, what's up next for you? Uh, nothing. I can't compare with that. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just teasing. D Dr. Francis, I appreciate you talking about Thanksgiving and stuff. So uh, working with the National Museum, uh, National Museum of the American Indian on some uh, comic book pages for Thanksgiving, not necessarily around the feast, but the key players, both uh, native and non at that around that time and understanding the landscape and such. Uh, that's pretty exciting. And I believe that'll be part of the Native Knowledge 360 project as well. Um, I have the honor of being a keynote speaker upcoming this October, I believe, in the Western Literature Association. Uh, that'll be really uh, fun. I think uh, Dr. LaPonce's mother, uh, Dr. Elizabeth LaPonce's mother, will be there as well as we're both keynoting. Uh, and then I think I'm going out to Texas uh, during the hottest part of the year uh, to speak for the uh, Caddo, on Caddo, Caddo Mounds Historical Society. Uh, they're having an artist series, so they asked me to come out. So. I really try to keep it low and, and try not to do too much. So hopefully I don't have too much on my plate like I always do. So but we'll see. <laughs> right. I want to extend a very special thanks to our presenters today and to all the teachers who took time to join us. If you want to learn more about Lee and Michael's work and introduce your students to their work, here's their social media. Thanks again, Lee and Michael, and to everyone that joined us today. Thank you, Jen, Michael, and Lee. What an amazing conversation. Before we wrap up for tonight, please take three minutes to fill out our evaluation. You'll find the link for it inside the chat. Both these sessions will be available on our NK360 website. In addition, you'll receive a list of follow-up resources from NNMAI, with a few trusted sources for a list of graphic novels and comic books we recommend. Those will come via email in about a week. Thanks again for joining us. Have a good night.